what we're talking about here are some principles that I think of as guidelines. In my weaker moments, I would say these were rules, but uh, through about 21st century, you can't say that anymore. So these are guidelines. The first thing to think about <coughs> with the writing endeavor, <coughs> one of the problems that you can face in your doctoral studies, junior career, is approaching problems as if I've got to get an article written, I've got to get a dissertation written. Thinking about the end result as final product. And that can be very daunting. What I recommend to people is to not do that. Don't think I'm writing a dissertation. Think you're collecting information, you're collecting, you're reading the literature to write the outline, to write the chapters, to write eventually something that might be a dissertation. I, I do this pretty much all of my work. So you see in this case, what's on the left side of the picture? What is that? Big rocks. What's on the right side of the picture? Yeah. So at one point, that cathedral on the right side was, in fact, a bunch of rocks. But as we'll see later in the program today, people who built that cathedral didn't drag all those rocks to that field site. So we'll come back to that. So that's the first point. Think about what you're doing in, as a process, as a series of steps, as intermediate products. What are all the intermediate products you're going to have to go through to get you to the next stage in the process? Second, this is, I know if you go to a session on, uh, with the journal editors, they will talk about this. I have my own particular take on this. I love to use sports analogies. I come from a university in North Carolina, which is known for its sports programs. Well, if you think about the uh, problem that the athletic directors and the coaches face in setting up at schedules for the coming year. And the, the, it, but starkly, there are a couple of choices. Those of you who watch professional sports, or watch college sports, know these quite well. The, it's possible to build up a really good preseason record by playing East Overshoot Tech, uh, Little Sisters of the Poor, Our Lady of Perpetual Sorrows, you know, picking the weak opponents and winning lots of games, getting you up to the point where you look really good on paper. So I said, well, what, what's the objective here? So they did pretty clear that choosing weak opponents, in this case, journals analogy, choosing weak targets may get you published. But in the long run, it's, it's not going to fool anybody. That's not a good winning strategy. The idea is, from the beginning, I tell people, target, aim as high as you can. Make a journal that you really love to be in. Don't let people tell you it's not possible, that the odds are against you, that it's 10% acceptance or 5%. Or pick a journal that has very high standards. So, how many, what's the, what was the, uh, the uh, deadline this year for getting a paper to the academy? Anybody know? January 12th, yes. January 10th. How many of you submitted papers this year? How many of you submitted your paper one week or more before the deadline? How many submitted it? <laughs> Two days before the deadline. How many submitted it the day before? Yeah. Why? Why did you wait? You knew in September, I should probably know today, you know now that for the 2018 Academy meetings, the deadline is going to be around January 10th, right? Why would you wait until January 3rd or 4th or 5th or 6th? To submit your paper. Is it because it wasn't ready or something? Not your hands, all ones or yes. Yeah. That's an incredibly bad habit. It's an incredibly bad habit. You know today what it's due. You should start working on it today. There's no reason for waiting. Lots of reasons why not waiting has really strong payoffs. Let me explain this. You may have had this experience, I often have this experience. I'm, I'm sitting in a traffic light waiting for the light to change, or I'm at the gym working on a treadmill or stretching or something, and all of a sudden an idea comes to me. I recognize a solution I hadn't seen before to the problem that I've had encountered in the data analysis of identity or conceptual. Why does that happen? It's because the brain never sleeps. 
One of the reasons why you want to start early is that you're telling your brain, this is a really important thing I'm doing. So why should I wait until, let's say, mid-December after class is in to really get serious about the video What does that give you? It gives you a month. You start today, how many months do you have? Do the math. Am I right? Six months. Sending your brain the signal, this is an important thing to work on. That means that in the next six months, while you're awake, while you're asleep, while you're reading associated affiliated literature, you're going to be thinking subconsciously about that. So if you start today, plan on, let's say, your first draft being viable by early December, late November, you've got plenty of time to circulate this paper, get comments from people, and revise it. And the name of this game is revision. The thing you never want to do, ever, 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 is have the first official read of your paper be by the editor you sent to. That's an incredibly dangerous thing to do. The trick is to have so many eyes on that paper way prior to that, that by the time you send the paper to the journal or to a conference, it's been through all of the revisions and it's much better than it started out to be. So the only way to get to that point is if you learn not procrastinate. How many of you, when you sit down to write, are at a desk surrounded by journals, PDFs, books, piles of notes? Let me see your hands. Yeah. How many of you sit down to a clean desk? Well, those of you who sat down surrounded by PDFs, books, journals, things like that. I used to ask people the question, why did you do this? But I pretty much know it's always the same answer. They had to look something up again. They were afraid they misquote somebody. They were afraid they didn't remember something. So they wouldn't look it up again. So I'm thinking now, though, how efficient is that? Imagine, back to our example of the cathedral, the Santiago Cathedral. Imagine if the stonemasons had just blown up that cliff and dragged huge rocks over the mountains in Santiago, and then on the building site began to chop up the size of blocks they actually needed. That doesn't make any sense. Or imagine you're building a log cabin. You go into the forest, you chop down a huge tree, you drag the tree roots and all branches, you drag that cabin, that, that log, to the building site, and you start hacking it up at the size of lumber they need. It's absurd. Both well, these scenarios are absurd. You're doing the same thing when you're sitting down with those books, articles, PDFs, and digested notes. You're starting to write too soon. You're not ready to write yet. You need to have that material in a form, in a format, where it's useful to you as a writer. I'm talking about production writing. I'm talking about writing. But you need to have that material processed. And so, this is where we get to the critical takeaway here. Your goal when you're reading should not just be to take a highlighter and, and mark the important thoughts or to write in the margins of the article. This is a good point. Your goal when you're reading material that's going to lead to the literature review, first well, pages of the paper, whatever, the first chapter of the thesis, your goal should be to be able to put that paper down, put that book down. Turn to your computer, or in my case, a yellow legal pad, and write a summary of what you just read. <clears throat> Not to slavishly copy word for word what you read, or cut and paste it into a little document, because then you got the same problem. When eventually you want to use this, you still got the problem of interpreting what it means. The idea in your reading is to figure out, in the process as soon as you can, why this is being read. What you're doing when you're doing these interpretive notes, reading, writing summaries, writing interpretations, you're writing for your future self. Because when your future self, in a month or two or three, goes to look at these notes, you're not going to remember precisely the context in which you read this. And if all you've got is the PDF, or some bullet points, whatever, it's going to be very hard for you to remember why were you excited about this. In fact, 
maybe it turns out three months ago when you read this, you said, this is crap. You forgot that. Now they say, now you have to pick it up and look at it again. Oh, yeah, now I remember. This is crap. The idea is to get to the point where your future self picks up these notes and understands where this fits into the greater scheme of things. And that can only happen if you give up reproducing what you read and instead interpreting what you read and writing it in your own voice. And that's the, that's the point here. So I use my notes. So when I sit when I sit down to write, I often have a folder. I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm a paper guy. I have a computer. Not a, not a Luddite. I have an iPad, I have a smartphone, I have four or five computers. But I still like paper because paper lets me take out a red pen or a green pen, lets me cut things up, lets me like big, big pictures and circles. So I, I like the tangibility, the materiality of the writing process for me is really critical. And we know actually probably you have to study this too. We know people who take notes by hand do better on exams than people who take notes on the Because they because of the body cognition. Process in body in body cognition means basically you've got another one more signal to your brain as to why this is important. <clears throat> so you may well have been emotional when you're writing this, and it's going to as, a, as you write by walk by hand what you've just discovered, it's going to stick with you longer. Uh, I have a blog post. Maybe some of you saw this. I called it "Imagination Interrupted." How many of you had this experience? You sat down to write. You're all set, you've got all the materials, <clears throat> you're, you're at a cup of coffee, you're sitting down to write, and then all of a sudden, ping, oh, Facebook post from a friend. Ping, oh, an email about that party tomorrow. Ping. So, first obvious thing, turn off your phones. If you've got a notification set up on your laptop or your smartphone, when you get stuff, turn that off. Turn it off, I you shouldn't have that off. For sure, turn it off when you're writing. Turn off the cell phone. Be in the moment. Bring yourself to the place you're going to write and keep all the other things that are in your life out of that process. Now, these are tips. I don't know if I have to go into great detail on these. The cognitive psychology reason to do this is that we know from studies, we know that if you're interrupted in any kind of task, in any semi complex task, we know if you're interrupted, it takes you five to ten minutes to get back into the task again. Every interruption, every disruption screws the process up. So this is actually one of the reasons why there are lots of arguments about open floor plans and offices and computers. Partly because of this problem, the interruption, the constant interruptions really do mess up the flow of work for you because you have to recenter yourself on the task at hand. So I say take a place that choose a time of I know some of you like coffee shops. I don't recommend it because in a coffee shop you'd like to see somebody you know and you have to explain to them, no, I can't talk to you now because I'm working. <laughs> so the better strategy is to pick a place where there's either nobody or where the rules are such that nobody can interrupt that. Like a library or you're behind a closed door, whatever you might be. Another simple part to that also is when you're writing, I never I never work more than 50 minutes at a time. I get up, walk around, and come back. Actually, that means a good question. How many of you, when you're working, sometimes feel this kind of flow coming over you? So you keep working 10, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2, 3, 2
three o'clock or two o'clock at night, and I can't disabuse them. You're older, you're more mature, your brains are myelinized. You know this, and I can tell you this, you, you do cognitively every day. Don't binge. Don't binge. Binge is not going to work. Binge is a waste of your energy. Writing process. So one of the things about writing process is really important to understand. What I've been talking about so far with respect to taking notes, the literature review, this is what um, some writers, writing coaches call free writing. That is, you're, you're not writing to a deadline, you're not writing with a particular target, you're, you're free associating to some extent, you're trying to uh, interpret what you've read, and you're not concerned with formality, the formalities of grammar. You don't care about spelling mistakes, you don't care about grammatical mistakes, you're just generating words that later can be edited. Right? That's, that's what most of your writing will actually be if you follow these procedures. Most of your writing is free writing, taking notes, interpreting things, writing summaries of summaries. Production writing is when you actually sit down to compose a paper. Most of what I've been talking about today is not about production writing and so on. Production writing is when you've got an outline. You're not, you actually have the subassembly exposed because now you know what the sections are of the paper. Uh, I work from an outline. My outlines, again, on yellow pads, sometimes quite a bit. If the office runs out of yellow pads, it's usually a crisis. And I tell the office manager, you've got to get some more yellow pads and I can't write. On my yellow pads, when I'm finished with this, I typically have a stack of, uh, what's it, or a big stack of the notes I've taken, and then in turn I've written an outline with those notes key to where I am in the outline, where they're going to be right in the outline. So the outline gets generated at some point when I recognize what the paper's about. Typically that happens, and we'll talk about later, when the title comes to me. I finally realize what the title of the paper is. It comes to me. And once I've done that, then it's really a pretty simple matter to write the outline. So the outline is what you're working from when you sit down to the production file. That's what should be on your or probably on your computer. You have the outline, I would put it off actually so you can mark it up. You got the outline, then you have all these notes, now you put the notes together with the outline and you're right. You probably all knew this, right? You know about not copy anything while you write. How many of you do do this anyway? You're going to go, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a terrible thing. I tell people it's not going to be a, completely avoidable. The trick is to, to give yourself a reward or a milestone, and then you can edit. So I say, let's say, write a page, write two pages, write a section, and then copy it. You know, don't hold off, because you'll just go nuts. Like, so you, you see those misspelling, and you'll see those grammatical mistakes, and you say, oh my god, I can't stand it. Nobody can see this but you. Right, this is, why, should you why should you care what it looks like at this point? Nobody can see it. So hold off. Give yourself a reward. Say to yourself, OK, when I get to the next page, then I'll go out for a call. When I get to the next page, and I'll come back and I'll go through and I'll fix things, make them make them pretty. Don't copy it. But if you if you copy it while you're writing, you're doing the same thing as if you're sitting in Starbucks walking with your friends to come through. Same thing's happening. Right? You're constantly imagine, well, actually more generally, when you if you're sitting down with all these books and papers and you're trying to production write, and you stop every couple of sentences to look something up, what's happening? Every time you pick up a book, a PDF, look something up, there goes your train of thought. Right? You had a narrative going, now you're stopping it. Not that the brain is trying to get that story out, and you're stopping, you're, just, you're saying, no, wait a minute, we got to get that exactly right. Save that. You can always put the references in later, just stick in a placeholder. Just say, citation goes here. Look this up, and then keep going. Do the right. I have more about that. I'm not going to go into all the details about this, because I think most of you, by this point, you've had a few courses that based on writing and subscribe, so you know some of these things. The, for me, the critical trick is that I, when I'm writing, begin at the beginning. I never write the third or the fourth or the fifth section, like let's say the methods section or the results. I never write those sections until I've written the first section. Never do that. Why is that? Because the story starts at page one. And 
the methods section has to be in the service of explaining why what I promised at the beginning is being done in a certain way. So you can't write the methods section before you write the first page. And you can't start writing up your results with paper to you write the first page. It started at the beginning. And actually, it goes forth. I mean, this, this is a challenge for the experienced writers. I would say for the experienced writers. The trick is the first paragraph. So my goal, not often realize, but okay, my goal is actually I want to write the first paragraph of my paper first. I want to know what the paper's about. And I'll give you an example. How many of you know the paper Fools Rush in? How did you feel? Okay, so, so we sat down and I said, what the first when starting a new business is difficult under any conditions. Lots of challenges, lots of uncertainty. But starting a new business in an industry that's unprecedented is particularly difficult. When you start a business when there are no other templates to follow, no models to follow, you're going to make lots of mistakes. It seems foolish under those conditions to do so. Nonetheless, people do it. How do they manage it? Well, the problems they have to manage in particular have to do with cognitive legitimacy and socio-political legitimacy. In this paper, we will discuss how the process unfolds. And there's the first paper, here, perfect. Right. Once I knew that was the story of the paper, you can see everything else follows from it. I know I knew what the story was going to be. I didn't know how it would work out exactly, but I knew Mark Malana and I knew that was the story. And now it's a matter of unpacking that in the subsequent sections of the paper. So my suggestion to you is to know your to know what you're going to do so well you can actually write the first paragraph of your papers. And the first paragraph is not something like, many people have said that, or it has long been argued that, or we need more information, we need more research on, or something. I think the word was going to be canceled. Don't do that. Your first paragraph should be a substantive paragraph. It should identify the particular problem that your paper is addressing, the sensibility you're going to bring to it, anticipating perhaps the what the theme is, what the flow is going to be, but not necessarily. So that's, that, for me, makes it much easier to write the rest of the paper once you know that story. But then the outline follows. The other thing that I see with um, lots of students is that I know some of you, I, I know you have this tendency, but you say to yourself, you know, I've read a lot, but there's, I just noticed I'm looking at some references. There's a couple more things I haven't read. There's a couple more articles I need to read. Right? I, can't, I can't start. I can't start here because there's a couple of papers I know that Malekowitz and Krzyzewski wrote, and I just discovered that in this the Journal of Obscure Results. I gotta go read those articles before I start my paper. And every day there's an excuse like that. Every day. What's the problem? Let me put it in prosaic I started reading administrative science quarterly. Back in 1966. I have read thousands of articles since then. You will never catch up to me. <laughs> no matter how much you read, you will never catch up. This is the problem. Right? You'll never catch up. That shouldn't be your goal. You don't have to be encyclopedic. Your goal of the paper is to tell your particular version of events. Right? Your, it's your story. Other people's work has to be brought in in the service of your story. If I want to know what Carl White said about something, I'll go read Carl White. Or what I, what Howard Aldrich, I'll read my own version. That's not the goal. The goal of paper, the goal of your outline, and the goal of your writing process should be to use other people's stuff to tell your story. And you don't have to be encyclopedic. It just has to be plausible. That's a very little secret of literature. It just has to be plausible. And that you'll do, your, your advisors, your readers will help you with that. Did you, you miss it? But that's the, that's the idea. It can't be encyclopedic. It's not possible. In the entrepreneurship alone, there are over 100 English language journals. You can start now and start reading, and you'll never catch up with that literature alone. So, begin the beginning. Now, that's all I can preach about. That's okay. So one of the one of the uh, interesting things that happens to me when I'm 
at meetings, when I talk to people about their project, I say to somebody, what, 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 what's your, what are you working on? What's the, what's the project you're doing right now? Tell me about it. And almost always what they'll tell me is the data. I've got the PSED, I've got the GEM, I've got the NLSY, I've got this proprietary data set that Toby Stewart gave me, I've got this data set that's on online, da 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 da. It's almost always about the data. I said, no, no, I don't want to, no. what, what's, the, what's the story? What's the what's the big point? What's the big conceptual piece of what you're doing? Well, tell me that. Don't tell me about the data. And I realized when I heard this off and up, it just came to me a year or two ago, and I wrote this blog post that that this this really has a crippling effect on people. If you start thinking about your project in terms of your data, it's it's a crippling crippling affliction. What does that do? Because it means that you start thinking about the hypotheses as well as you could test with this data set. And you start thinking about what you're going to tell me about the problem in terms of what data you know you have. And so you start narrowing in, focusing in, giving up, being up, giving up some stuff that really would have been fun to talk about, but you can't talk about it because you know you're not going to have the data. So I tell people, right as if you don't have the data. I guess I could explain this picture. Anybody have seen this movie? That's the French version of the Code of the Dam. Alex, you've seen it? It's a great, oh, it's kind of a morbid story. But I just, in, this, in this story, there's this village in England where all these kids are little, are little blonde, white haired, well, actually more white haired kids with funny eyes. And it turns out they can read people's minds and they use this, they keep them out of space or something, and they use this knowledge of other people's minds to control them. And, they start, and the, the fear the villagers have is that someday, in fact, very soon, they're going to take over the entire UK. But the trouble is, once they start thinking about doing something, the kids can recognize this and they kill these people. So this school teacher, the poor bloke on the left there, gets the idea, well, he's going to create a way to get rid of these kids by building a bomb, taking it into this building where all the kids are, and thinking about something else while he's doing this. So he goes into this school class. He has this big brick wall between himself and the, and the bomb, which is behind this brick wall. He's standing in front of the class, and you can see the kids realize this. He's thinking about something, but he won't tell them what it is. So they're picking away the brick that he's in. Brick by brick, brick, brick falls. Brick, 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 brick. The last brick falls. So civilization is safe. Now, nothing as dramatic is going to happen with the papers. <laughs> but, if you remember this example, remember that. Build a firewall between the data and your thinking about your problem. Go off in, in, in directions that maybe you can't actually test at the moment. The time to talk about these limitations, the better way is when in the paper, in the end, you might talk about, well, here's what could be done. But what you also will discover is that you can lay out the problem. You don't have to test everything you say is relevant. You can say, this is what I'm, this is. Here's the, the nature of the problem. Here's the conceptual principles involved. I'm going to be able to test some of this in this paper, and others will later. So you build that brick wall, and write so you don't have the data. Now we get to the fun part. On the left here, I've listed a bunch of principles that I, I follow in my writing. Choosing titles. So, I think they're pretty much self-evident. The task for you is to look, can you see that first principle, apply the paper, so can you see the papers on the right between there? Anybody, anybody, anybody? Ferris Bueller, you want Anybody? Oh, yes, which one? Your paper. Fools Rush In? Yeah. yeah. That, pay, that title, Fools Rush In, is a long, there's a sub, there's a, after that, there's a longer bit. But Fools Rush In, that captures what Marlena and I were talking about. Fools Rush In, question mark. Is it foolish to start a business in an industry with no precedence? Fools Rush In. Right there. I like the second one, which is choose the title you must live up to. So I think actually for that, uh, a couple of those titles qualify. 
you can take the second one, you can dwarf start it small. It's a real paper. I don't know how I read it many years ago. It's about the big and the small liabilities and the biggest liabilities of aging. The point here is that I picked a title that is so outrageous that if I don't deliver, people can be really disappointed. I'll be disappointed. So I try to pick a title that I have to look up to. Emotional residence, yeah, who's the boss? That's pretty simple. That's the paper that TNT Yang and I had in the American Sociological Review about three years ago about women, who gets to be the boss in a, in a heterosexual, in a uh, mixed sex startup team. A Rolling Stone gathered momentum. Anybody read this yet? Anybody even know about this? You've read it. It's an AMR last year. AMR. So you're not reading everything. That's good. <laughs> uh, it should have been what? Rolling Stone feathers. Come on. Yeah. So Rolling Stone gathered momentum. It's kind of kind of Read that. Whoa, wait a minute. Why are you saying to yourself, what is this guy doing? And that's not the metaphor I was going to I find my template, you probably can see from this, a lot of those are movie titles, song titles, book titles. The great thing about our field is that you can't copyright song titles. You can't copyright book titles. You can't copyright movie titles. You can use these. As long as you don't use them to defraud, you can use these again and again. Somebody actually in, the, in biology did this. I, I saw a paper last year, uh, Bob Dylan's songs, a Rolling Stone, like a Rolling Stone, that paper's been used like 150. Times one of his papers, 75 times. That's why you don't do that. You can be more creative than that. But the point is, you can, you can choose anything you really like as long as you don't do it. You try to sell people something that they make them think that it's from the original. So, time bands, that's a, that was a movie years ago. Uh, it won't be used to so Don't use the same titles. So don't use my titles. <laughs> Another, I should just say a bit about the simplicity part. Entrepreneurship through social networks. How simple can a title be? What's that paper about? <laughs> Let me think. <laughs> Probably entrepreneurship. Okay, so social networks. Yeah, you were here rehearsal. Right? Yeah, that paper. There's nothing, nothing new in this paper. Absolutely nothing new in this paper. Everything we put into that paper back in 1986 was already in the social networks literature. And I and with another thing, nothing new in it at all. It gets cited, it's been cited a couple thousand times. Why? Because of the title. People are writing a paper on networks and entrepreneurship and they think, gee, what can I use to show that I really know this area? <laughs> entrepreneurship through social networks. I didn't have to read it. Now, you, know, you shouldn't behave that way, but it's tempting sometimes. You might slip. So simple, evocative, perhaps I'm having some emotional resonance. These are all tips that I would say help with the writing process. So back to what I said earlier. My goal is actually to discover what the paper is about by coming up with a title for it. That's my goal. So I knew for time bandits, I knew with Time Bandits two years ago, when Stephanie Decker and Skid Lippman and I started working on the project, I, I said, Time Bandits, what do entrepreneurs do? Well, they, they rummage through time, back and forth. They're, they're constructing narratives about their ventures. What are they doing? Talking about the future, talking about the past. Time Bandits, there's the title. Then they're filming. Now we've got to look up to that title, because those of you like you have seen the movie, which is a little weird, you know, uh, do something to make that possible. I've already mentioned this. The, the worst possible, the worst possible situation to be in is sending a paper to a conference or to a journal that has not been read by anybody or your advisor. Because the reviewers, remember, the reviewing process is blind. They can't do what they did in the old days. When I was at ASQ at a we would actually get people writing things to the Others like maybe you should check and see if this person has a PhD. Or this is this is really this is really terrible work. Why are you bothering me with this? You can't do that anymore. But you'll get the equivalent from some reviewers. They'll write several pages of comments making it very clear that they think the whole thing is misguided from the start. 
We could have avoided that had you gotten some help from friends. So, who to ask for help? Uh, your advisors, your fellow, fellow students, fellow faculty members. I tell people to use these meetings as a way to do this. this now, again, those of you who are faculty back there can you know this. In. One of the tricks I did when I was a kid at your age, I'd go to the meetings and I'd go to a session, and it would be a session where I, I had an interest in what the person was doing. And I'd go up to them and I'd say, you have a working paper on this. You're working on other a, a, a papers in the scheme, because I've read your previous work and I'm really interested in this. And could you send me a copy? I didn't even say to them, you have a comment. I just said, can you send me a copy? I did the papers. I had a lot of time on my hands in this day. I did the papers and I'd write them comments and send them comments back to them. And then invariably, they'd be blown away by the fact that they got comments from anybody, which is very unusual, trust me. Very few people at these meetings go away and write comments on the papers. So when you get comments back from somebody, it catches your attention. It's not like if your shoes on fire. You kind of notice it. So the trick is use these meetings. You have lots of opportunities. The next between now and Tuesday, all these people are trapped here. <laughs> they're either in the they're in Lowe's, High Regency, the Marriott, they're trapped here. So that you're going to see them in the hallways, you're going to see them in sessions. Some of the people like Dean Shepard, you're probably not going to see too many sessions. But you see Dean in the hallways. And you can say, Dean, you know, I was reading that paper you did on uh, emotionality and or the emotional side to business failure or whatever. And I'm doing something on that too. And I'm really curious, are you still, are you working on anything relevant to that now that I can, I can see from you? He may say to you, with Dean's a nice guy, he may say, Jesus, yeah, are you working on something like that? Then the conversation starts. Even if it doesn't start here, you're responding to the paper with a written note to them, or probably with an email. It's going to get something going. It's the normal reciprocity. Once you start getting people to recognize that you are being, you want to be helpful to them, they have an obligation in the norms of our society to be helpful. So use these meetings as a way of beginning to establish relations with people who are working in an area that you're also working in, which means. Conversely, don't spend all your time with your friends. Now, I'm, I'm going to be watching you. Those of you who go down to Persian Social, or tonight the doctor, dinner, whatever, I'm going to be watching you. If I see you hanging out with people you already know, I'm going to break it up. Homophily <laughs> <laughs> rules among, in, in social relationships. So you've got to, you've got to fight homophily with all your life. Fight homophily. Meet people who so, last point. That's a picture. That's a picture of me on the right side. What am I doing? Am I writing? Am I a computer? All I've done is fly fishing. When you fly, how many? How many you fish? How many people fly fish? So, so you know if you fly fish, you know when you're fly fishing, you can't think about anything. Is there, is there a trout in your mouth fly? Or is there a, is a dry fly especially? You can't look away. If you start thinking about other stuff, you get, you get a millisecond when the trout decides that looks like a bug I could eat, and then realizes that's not a bug I could eat, and spits it out. So you gotta concentrate. Now it is true when I'm doing this, in the, the back of my brain, remember my brain's always working, I told you this. My brain is always on. So I know that, because occasionally I'll be Fishing, I'll look up at a tree, I'll see a deer comes down to the water, a blue heron flies off or something, and I'll say, oh wow, that just gave me an idea. That does, that, that happens because I'm completely free in that moment so that anything that comes into my brain rattle around for a while. I'm not reading Facebook stuff, I'm not sending up Snapchat, or Instagram. So one of the critical things that you're going to discover in this profession is that you need to find these quiet moments where you're not totally overwhelmed or stimuli. For me, it's fly fishing, because some of you might be reading a good book, taking more walks, you name it. Except for thanks to you, Howard, for your time and thoughts. <laughs>